Hi guys, welcome to the CISSP course part 1. After the real success of my CISSP tips video, I decided to help you a little bit more and provide you a CISSP course. This course will actually be built on two parts. The first part will address the four first domains of the CSSP out of the total of eight domains. Then the second part will address the remaining four. I will be really highlighting the main and key points that I consider being very important for you to understand and knowing especially the right concepts. What I will be talking about and explaining during this course are definitely not enough as concept for your exam. This is a course that will be an additional support for your preparation to make sure that you did not miss any concept and that you know all the required uh, knowledge to be prepared for your six hours exams. Yes, it's a long time. I always keep on saying that, but it is. So before starting the course, make sure that you understand these points. First, it is extremely important to understand all the concepts of the CSSP, and not only a few of them, because the exam address all the concepts and doesn't leave behind any of them. Second thing, make sure that you actually rely on the official resources, like the ones that you can find of, uh, on ISC Square website. Third and important point, make sure that you actually pass and get some practice exams, which are also available on the official website of the ISC Square. And last, even if you had taken other examination, Please be aware that the CSSP certification and exam are very different. First of all, the exam does not rely on your memorization. It means that memorizing all the study book will not help you to pass the exam. You need to understand the concept. And second thing, the way that the questions are asked is very different from the other exams that you have probably passed already, like the CCNA or any other. So please take in consideration these points before moving forwards. And I hope that all the points and all the knowledge that I'm sharing will be only helpful for you and will bring you success in your certification. So for this course, I have also decided that I do not want it to be the same as the other courses. So you will see that over my explanations and my presentation, there will be some really funny moments and I hope you will enjoy it. So let's learn and let's have fun at the same time. One of the main aspects that I would like to bring in here that I had a lot of requests about is what are the ISC Square requirements to actually be certified. Please note that the CISSP exam passing is one thing, but the CISSP certification is another thing. You need to make sure that you have the prerequisite to be certified and not only to pass the exam. So the requirements include checks on your backgrounds, five years of experience and professional experience in any of the 10 or 8 domain of the CSSP. Previously it was 10, nowadays it's 8 domains. They have been combined. Or 4 years of experience if you have a college degree. And then, of course, you need to pay for your exam. The fees are not uh, reimbursable. And then having an approved application. It's also important to realize that you need to agree on the code of ethics of ISC Square. So be sure that you have this prerequisite. Um, from my experience, again, I got requ requests from people being in different um, functions and wanting to pass the exam is great. You can learn a lot of concepts. However, you, are not, you might not be able to be certified if you do not have the right professional experience. So let's start with the domains. There are eight domains nowadays, and I will be addressing the first four.
Let's go through them. The eight domains are security and risk management, asset security, security engineering, communication and network security, identity and access management, security assessment and testing, security operations, and software development security. So let's come back to the fact that we need to understand the security in a holistic way. It's important, especially after all the attacks that are going on and on. And actually, this first chapter, Information Security and Risk Management, will address security management responsibilities, uh, the difference between the different controls, including technical, administrative, and physical. It will address the main security principles, the triad, CIA, and then the information policies, as well as information classification and security awareness training. I have been requested a long, lot of times about the goals of information security. So I always put in place as a first and main goal of an information security strategy, the three main principles of security, which are confidentiality, integrity, and availability. When it comes to confidentiality, this principle allows you and make sure that your data is not compromised or shared with a third party. In terms of integrity, this principle allows you and make sure that the data is not damaged or modified. Availability allows you to make sure that the data is always available. So let's give an example of each of them. Confidentiality allows you to make sure that whenever you store or save your data, it will not be just accessible through uh, an a channel for to someone else. Let's take an example. You have a very confidential printed document and then you leave it on the table. You are breaking out, out actually the confidentiality principle because a third party can access the document. Integrity example can be very quickly found through, for example, accounting operations. Let's take an example of someone uh, filling up an Excel file and that person is entering different financial information manually. That person can actually commit a mistake and therefore change the value that has been entered manually in the Excel file. Therefore, the data integrity will be compromised. Availability is mainly related, as we mentioned, to the availability of the data at any point of time. And this means that, let's take an example of you wanting to log in on your banking interface to access to your information online. And you know that any time, any point of time, you will have this accessibility available. These are the three main goals and principles of the security um, and risk management. So make sure that you understand the triad, CIA, uh, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So today we see a lot of companies building their cybersecurity strategy and information security strategy, having different and various teams working on this and various other concepts without even really understanding them and therefore creates a really a risk for the companies. It is important that it is not only about buying the latest technology that allows a company to protect the itself. It is all about the right strategy and governance. Let's take an example of the ISO 27001-2013. This is one of the risk management framework that allows you to cover the different aspects of service of information security domains, including information security policies for the organization, creation of information security infrastructure, asset classification and control, personal security, physical and environment security, communications and operations management, access control, or system development and maintenance, business continuity management, and finally compliance. I always advise my customers and my uh, professional uh, colleagues 
to make sure that they collaborate between the compliance and the, in the technical departments for the reasons that are fully obvious and still keep not being obvious for the organizations. In fact, in order to provide the right technical um, applications of the requirements of the risk management as well as to make sure that the organization is compliant, you need a clear collaboration between the different organizations. This was one example of the different risk management frameworks. However, we do actually have others. We do hear about COBIT and COSO providing what needs to be achieved, but not how to achieve the achieve it. And this is very different from the ISO um, information security risk management framework. The ISO 27000, especially 1-2013, gives you clear instruction of how to achieve uh, the different uh, points that I mentioned previously. I will come back to the definitions of COVID and COSO, which you need to be aware of for the exam. So let's go and address a little bit more secure, the security governance. So the security governance is actually a set or a group of responsibilities and practices provided by the board and the executive management, helping with the strategic direction and ensuring that the objectives are achieved which is different from the other concepts. So make sure that you understand the difference of the security governments versus, versus security management. Both are different and you might have to address these topics during your exam. So now we're gonna come back into more details about the different security frameworks as well as the security concept, concepts. But let's start from the beginning and what you need to, uh, what are the steps that you need to provide in order to achieve the principles of security, which we talked about previously, which means integrity, availability, and confidentiality. So as you can see per the slide, the different steps will come from identification, authentication, authorization, auditing, and then accounting. Identification will allow you to identify the requester or the person asking for the access, for example, through the username. Authentication will authenticate and make sure that the person is the real person through the password. Authorization will make sure that you have the right rights to access or not to access the correspondent data. And auditing will allow you to have and record all the logs. The review, of course, is part of the whole risk management strategy and allows you to review the current situation. A successful security program would be based on different steps, including planning and organizing, implementing, operating and maintaining, as well as monitoring and evaluating. Currently, many organizations do not follow the right approach and they find themselves in very difficult situations without proper policies and procedures in place or several disconnections between business and security teams, no way of accessing any return on investment or having a clear understanding of the current and required especially spending, having and relying only on technological solutions, as well as a full security feeling, especially when it comes to deploying only the latest security solutions and considering them as the main security um, controls to be put in place. Information security and information risk management have been for the latest year based on everything that was related to physical. I tend to say that this was due to the fact that previously we were working on the physical world, while today we, have, we are 
completely transforming and going into a digital world. And therefore, the data is one of the main assets that need to be protected. Therefore, the risk management should take in consideration not only the physical damage, the human aspect, the equipment malfunction or technical problems. Um, however, also it needs to take in consideration the data, the misuse of data, the loss of data, or even the applications um, misuse or applications problems. This will actually take in consideration a very important part that needs to be implemented in a risk management framework. Another important point which is related to the risk management uh, program would be to make sure that you have the wise, right risk management team, at least someone in charge of building the right um, approach. What I have seen from my own perspective is that companies rely on the IT management to build the right uh, security approach, which can be not in alignment of the current risk management uh, best practices and especially the concept that needs to be implemented following the CISSB requirements. So there is an important part which relies on building the right risk management team. Having said that, and having already the opportunity to rely on a risk management team, there is an important second step which relies on risk analysis. The risk analysis will be definitely based on having a reliable asset inventory. Again, what have been happening around the latest years is that the asset inventory was only related to the physical assets. Today, the assets go beyond the physical ones and require to be identified, including all the data, for example, customer information or others. This allows to have a clear inventory, as I mentioned, and therefore allows an organization to identify the vulnerabilities and threats. We will come back with some real examples about how to define a threat and how to calculate the risk. So let's come back to the fact that we have put in place a risk management team and we have a clear inventory of assets, including all the data assets. This means that your data will require data ownership. And for that, currently, we need to define a data owner, the person that will be responsible for the data classification, as well as a data custodian. The data custodian will be responsible for prescribing protection and actually implementing the right protection to preserve the classification defined by the data owner. So again, we said that an organization needs to make sure that they have the right risk management team, that they do have the right asset inventory and including the asset inventory, there, need, there is a need to define the ownership of each asset and therefore have a clear attribution to a data owner and a data custodian. There are two other concepts that are very important for any organization to understand, the due care and the due diligence. This concept have been put here in this slide because they are very important at any point of time for the risk management and for as well the um, accountability of the company or the individual. As you can see from the slide, due care means doing the right thing. In fact, if a company or an organization is able to provide all the processes that have been implemented in alignment with the right risk management framework and the right controls, then the organization has been providing the right due care. If the company is continuing to do the right thing and let's say maintaining and updating the, the risk management framework, the controls depending on the changes, doing the right testing for the business continuity plans and others, then the company is, is doing her due diligence. 
we will again come back to this concept, especially when we are talking about evidence. I have mentioned previously that there is a difference between security governance and security management. In fact, this is a concept that you need to understand in order to prepare your examination. Security management can be defined by three different types. The one that is strategic and therefore is a long-term plan with goals and objectives. The one that is tactical, it's a mid-term plan. And the one that is operational, which is a short-term plan. The tactical management will take in consideration risk analysis and management, personal security, auditing, vulnerability and threat management, development of metrics, common threats, data classification, business continuity. The operational management will take in consideration physical security, network security, incident response, for example, use of metrics, vulnerability and threat management as well, policy compliance, for example, or system life cycle security. And, but the strategic management will which is a long-term plan, will be the high-level plan, which will take in consideration the local laws, the regulations, the government model, the policy development, eventually the risk analysis and management, as well as organizational security. All these three different security management um, programs are very different in terms of who owns them, in terms of time of implementation, and in terms of goals. Here is a great overview of the different uh, hierarchical levels. You have first the policies, then the standards, then the guidelines, and finally the procedures. The policies actually are an overall statement or vision of the management of how the security should be implemented and what is allowed and what is not allowed with the company. The standards are actually mandatory uh, activities, actions or rules. They are a level higher. Guidelines are rather recommendations, the um, clear mandatory rules. And the guidelines, for example, we can find a lot of them in different countries around Asia. So you can Google and try to find out some guidelines implemented within the financial sector in Asia Pacific. And procedures, which is the last part, are literally clear steps and um, instructions of how to deal or how to apply the different policy standards and guidelines. Usually, in my from my experience, the first thing that I would build with the companies are the set of policies that they will approve, and then after the policies, we build together the procedures in order to make sure that they are clearly documented and all the employees are aware of how to. Uh, take actions and follow the right instruction to achieve the right goal. Okay, so let's come back to our assets. We have our inventory of assets and therefore we can define the different threats and vulnerabilities, calculate and estimate the impact of loss and use what we call the single loss expectancy to calculate as well the annualized risk and decide what would we do in front of the risk? Do we reduce the risk? Do we accept it or do we assign it? And in general, the annual cost of any cybersecurity measure or safeguard that you put in place should not exceed the expected annual cost of the asset loss. And let me go a little bit more into the details. So, so here is a clear example of the different asset inventory that you can find. The corresponded risk, the asset value, the potential loss, the annualized frequency, 
of how often it can happen in a year and the annual loss expectancy it means the clear loss per year that you can expect Let's take an example of the facility. The very common risk would be actually fire. The asset value is $560,000. The potential loss means that if a fire happens, then the damage will be estimated to $230,000. And how often that happens? The estimation depending on the statistics and the different historical events is estimated to 0.25. Therefore, the annual loss expectancy would be 0.25 times 230,000. This can be very simple when it comes to calculate uh, risk and an annual loss expectancy for a fire in a, on a facility. However, I got several questions when it came in turn to uh, trade secrets of co companies or data. How would you estimate the asset value and the potential loss as well as how often it happens? This definitely is not a very simple answer. However, my advice would be just go and search for different historical data around, on, uh, around the world and not only in your own country and try to find several examples of calculation. Let's say you have a business that is all uh, dealing with an e-commerce website and therefore if the e-commerce website with all your customers is down then you do not have a business anymore and therefore the whole value of the data is almost the whole value of the business this is just an example that i will give you to make sure that you understand how would you calculate the different asset value as well as the potential loss and the annual loss expectancy so let's come back a little bit to the previous slide to have first the right approach would be assign the asset value to the asset then calculate the exposure factor the exposure factor will allow you to see how much you will actually the the asset will actually lose in terms of value and then calculate the single loss expectancy how often that can happen and then annual sorry and this actually it says the annualized rate of occurrence that will allow you to to calculate the number of times that this happened and of course therefore you can calculate the annualized loss expectancy and perform your cost benefit and see how much you are able to calculate and estimate your budget for the countermeasures. So let's make it clear. The exposure factor is actually the percentage of loss if the threats happen and of course the asset will be damaged. The annualized rate of occurrence is the value that represents the frequency how often that threat can happen the single loss expectancy will be actually the asset value time the exposure factor that we have seen in the table and the annual annualized loss expectancy is actually the SLE time annualized rate of occurrence and therefore you can calculate how much is the amount that you will be able to spend maximum to perform again your countermeasures. We mentioned the different risk and actually when you define the current risk of your assets you can choose between three type of risk uh, actions either you transfer the risks for example with a new son the new offers that you have from the insurance companies like cyber insurance or either you accept the risk and therefore you are okay for example to open an office in a very high um, risky um, country where for example the 
earthquakes are very often happening. This is an example of risk acceptance. And then risk avoidance is actually to stop and not doing, not continuing to do, to taking the risk. For example, so you will not open that office in that country. The, of course, what will happen after this risk analysis is that the current scenario and the current calculations will allow you to um, mitigate the risk and to put in place the right countermeasures for the defined risks. And this is a clear method that is based on calculations of the risk and calculations using different uh, monetary, monetary values of the assets as well as different statistics. And this is what we call the quantitative risk analysis. So we have different and mainly two risk analysis methods. One is the quantitative, which we just did and described, and the other one is the qualitative, which doesn't require a lot of calculations or not cal no calculations at all, and is based on subjective opinions on individual. And one of the main and known techniques is actually the Delphi method, which is a risk analysis based on group discussion and on bringing opinions and comments that are written anonymously regarding the different uh, risks and threats that the company might go through. So let's see now what are the differences between the quantitative, quantitative uh, risk analysis and the qualitative risk analysis. In fact, the quantitative, as you will have numbers, you will have statistics, will be based on financial costs, will be automated as well, and will have and will require certain history. The qualitative, as we mentioned, is based on opinions and personal anonymized opinions. That means that you do not require any history and therefore you do not proceed with any calculations. Of course, both of them have pros and cons. What we can definitely understand is that the qualitative method is risk analysis is you utilized when the companies do not have enough history about, for example, the threats. Like the cybersecurity threats are so wide and some organizations really struggle to understand how often the threat can happen and what are the real statistics that may help them to calculate the proper budget for the countermeasures. Therefore, they go into a qualitative risk analysis. The fact that we have calculated the different, uh, the, the, the different countermeasure budget is important to understand also that you need to calculate the wise risk. And the risk, as we saw, is the impact time, the likelihood of the threat happening. And it's a combination of threat and vulnerability. So what you need to remember always is that risk is equal to impact time likelihood. And you had the example in a previous slides, and please do not hesitate to go and do some exercises about this. It might happen that you have a question about Access control is actually one of the features that is definitely a must in terms of, cyber, of security risk management and in terms of security approach. And the CSP requires you that you have a clear understanding of the different control types, including the ones that I just have prepared on the slide. So you have different kinds of controls, including the administrative, logical, and physical. This ones include additional types, which are preventive, detective, corrective, deterrent, recovery ones, directive, and compensative. Examples of administrative controls might be policies, rules, schedules, training, Logical controls will be tools and protocols used for identification, authentication, and authorization, as well as accountability. And physical controls 
are the ones that are around putting in place guards, for example, locks and different kind of physical controls. Preventive controls can be user registration, separations of duties, physical barriers, locks, um, even security guards, um, awareness training as well, which is preventative. Preventive. So please take, and take really the time to understand the different examples. Detective uh, controls can be review access logs, job rotation, uh, security awareness as well, monitoring access, CCTVs, which are detective. Uh, then corrective uh, measures and controls can be, um, for example, penalty, uh, administrative leave, uh, control termination process. A recovery ones can be business continuity, of course, disaster recovery planning, as well uh, in all of uh, site facility, and we're going to address that as well. The directive one can be, of course, policies and guidelines, uh, as well as procedures. An important part of the risk management is making sure that you have the right hiring process. And this process should take in consideration the different aspects, like background checks of the employee, the security clearances, employment agreements, and NDAs that you sign with the future employee of the company. There are a lot of uh, challenges and risks that an organization can avoid by taking these right steps. And the right steps and approach continue with a different separation of duties, which actually allows you to divide between several employees a critical task. So they do not provide the task, and the whole task overall uh, is not provided by one employee, but a few of them. Least privilege concept means that you give a new function as uh, using the minimum access possible or need to know for your employees, and then you make and then you make sure that you can add additional access. Job rotation is allowing you to rotate the personnel from one uh, responsibility to another. This is mainly to allow you to discover if there is any fraud and as well to make sure that you can provide a business continuity. Mandatory vacation allows you as well to detect fraud and this is mainly around providing mandatory one or two weeks of vacation to your employee. After the different concept previously described, the CSSP addresses as well the different types of law. You need to make sure that you understand what is criminal law, civil law, and administrative law. Currently, the criminal law actually protects your basic principles. The civil law uh, protects the transactions between people and organizations, and the administrative law protects day-to-day -day operations. You might have some questions regarding which kind of law should you be applying, so make sure you try and find some very good examples about different applications of this kind of law. The next concept that I would like you to understand and uh, definitely be familiar with are copyrights, trademarks, patents, and trade secrets. So the copyright will allow you to protect the ownership or authorship of, uh, for example, a document. Uh, this is very often used for songs and musics. Um, the trademark is protecting the names and logos, for example, of companies like Responsible Cyber or Peerless, both have trademarks and are protected. Patents are protecting rather inventions and not idea. I would like to make sure that this is clear. There is a very difference between, a very big difference between uh, actually protecting an idea and an invention. A pattern requires you to protect 
uh, not only the idea as such, but actually the process and the different um, technical requirements that allows you to provide that idea. So basically the invention as such. And finally, the trade secret, which actually the trade secret will protect the company's operation. Let's say the organization has a very specific process in place and a certain algorithm to create, to calculate their own uh, financial expenditure, their own um, uh, costs, and their own uh, minimal valuable product cost market. So this, for example, can be actually declared as a trade secret and the company can protect these processes. So, of course, it's important for an organization, again, to know where and how to address all the risks. And as I said, I do not like to this course to be really very typical. I'm bringing up the right concepts that you need to know. This is not sufficient. You need to go by yourself and try to understand them, try to see the different examples of implementation and how that really works. So, just to make be sure that uh, we have a clear understanding of what we have addressed. We have addressed the risk management process. We have seen that you need a clear inventory of assets. We have seen and addressed the data ownership as well as the different difference between the security governance and the security management. We have as well understood and defined how to calculate the budget for your countermeasure, including uh, defining the asset value um, with the SLE and uh, the ALE. So make sure that you remember these abbrevi abbreviations. Make sure that you understand how you calculate them. So now that you have been through the first uh, chapter, take a few minutes of break and come back just after. The second domain that is addressed is asset security, which is the second domain of the CSSP. And we will be addressing here different uh, aspects of the asset security as the title mentions. So let us start. You need to understand what is the difference between PIE and PHE. So PIE is the personally identifiable information, data that can identify an individual in particular. Um, there are several details here that needs to be taken in consideration. Not all the information is considered as PII. It is important to understand that this is only considered as PII if it allows you to define and identify an individual in particular and not just guess or have approximative information. The protected health information with us to PHI, which is actually related to health information and data, uh, again, uh, related to the individual, allowing to discover an individual in particular. And for example, what they have been um, done previously for research purposes is that medical uh, data has been used for research but the data is transformed to be anonymous. However, this means that they need to be very careful about what kind of data is handled, as again, if a group of, info, of data is very particular to an individual and allows you to define that individual in particular and no one else, then that data needs to be protected. And therefore, it might represent a personally identified information or protected health information. So when it comes to data, of course, there is, as we mentioned, the asset inventory that is part of the risk management that you need to understand. And we mentioned that you have the data owner that is responsible for that data. So just to make it clear, you have your asset inventory, you have the ownership of the asset that is defined, you have your data custodian that will put in place the right controls. However, having said that, you need to make sure that you have the right classification of the data and you are not protecting data that is actually public. 
So in the military system, the classification has been from top secret, secret, confidential, sensitive but unclassified, and unclassified. In the commercial, um, commercial aspect and in the commercial organizations, what has been used is confidential, private, sensitive, and public. So whenever your data owner is actually classifying the information, it is his responsibility to define whether the information or the data is confidential or private, sensitive or public, and therefore afterwards the data custodian will put in place and implement the right controls in alignment with the policy defined by the management. An important additional concept that you need to be aware of and understand is the sanitiza sanitization concept. In fact, to protect your digital assets or data, you will need to make sure that you remove your data out from the system or from the media in an effective way. And this is what we call sanitization. There is, uh, of course, a uh, no, possibility or a certain um, percentage of possibility that there will be still data remaining on the asset. And therefore, that's what we call data remanence. The data remanence is the data that stays on the hard drive or as a residual magnetic flux. And therefore, you can access that data if you have the, uh, the hard drive. So for the exam, what you need to make sure that you um, have a clear understanding of is not only the concept of sanitization, but also to understand how you can proceed with the sanitization. And for that, we have defined different procedures. The first one is the ghosting. And the ghosting means that is uh, using a magnetic field in order to actually erase or eliminate the data. And this is done on tape or disk media. Erasing is another approach to delete data. It's very simple, it's literally deleting the data from the media. Um, clearing or overwriting is preparing the media from reuse and as it says it's overwriting so basically if you have a hard disk you will write on top of it and then uh, you will overwrite the previous existing data. Purging is a more intense form of clearing. So what you need to remember you have the sanitization which is actually the process of deleting data from your media and then you have one, two, three, four types of how you can proceed with that. The ghosting, erasing, clearing, overwriting, or purging. Make sure that you understand when do you need to use which one. An example, to remove data from the solid state drives, SSDs, a commonly is used destruction because none of the previous state methods will work. So make sure again that you remember and uh, this types of sanitization and that you understand which one can be used to which purpose and on which media. As we have been talking about data and data sanitization, there is one concept actually and a principle that you need to be aware of in terms of data transfer, which is called safe harbor, and it might come also within your exam question. The safe harbor is actually principles that is describing and um, defining methods of uh, how to transfer data between the UE states and therefore respecting the UE data protection law. So just to make it clear, safe harbor principles is a method of ensuring that third parties are complying with the UE data protection law. So when it comes to transfer data from outside the UE countries, just to make it clear, um, there are several questions that came out with this concept. The seven principles are actually notice, choice, onward, transfer, security, data integrity, access, and enforcement. So 
I won't go into the details, just make sure that you remember what it is about. So these are the first chapters that we have been addressing and domains. Uh, I hope that it was clear and helpful for you. Take a break because we are going to the next one, security engineering, which will be a little bit more detailed and longer especially. So take a, a nice um, maybe glass of water, uh, 15 minutes break and come back to follow next. Thanks. So we are moving to the next domain, which is security engineering, and let's go and start. So first of all, uh, it is very important for you to understand the encryption process. And of course, encryption is actually making sure that you cannot read clearly the information. So basically, you have a plain text that goes through an encryption algorithm and therefore provides you with a cipher text, which cannot be read unless it is decrypted. One co concept that you need to remember is also the work function or the work factor, which defines the strength of a cryptography system. This might come up in the exam as well. So cipher text result of the plain text going through an encryption algorithm. The second concept about encryption is actually hashing. So hashing will transform a string of character into a certain shorter fixed length value. And therefore, in this, um, in this slide, you can see that the different input gives you, as a result, a digest, what we call, and the digest has one fixed length output very important to remember and then it's only one way so you are not able to dehash the um, the digest to go back into the input it's not like encryption when you can decrypt to have your initial message and then it's based on collision uh, free principle, which means that two different inputs will not give you two same digest. And this is, of course, to make sure that uh, you do not have any errors or mistake. So what is the difference between encryption and hashing? Very important to understand for you that the encryption will allow you to have the principle of confidentiality, but the encryption does not allow you to have integrity, authentication, and non-repudiation. If you remember, we have uh, actually addressed the non-repudiation when someone is able or is not able to actually confirm that he was the one uh, sending, for example, the email. And this is all about understanding and accountability of the individual providing the action. The hash function is actually not able to provide you the confidentiality, but will provide you the integrity of the message most of the time. And therefore, that's the main difference between encryption and hashing that you need to remember. Encryption will provide you confidentiality, hashing will provide you integrity. Other conce concepts that are important for you to remember, zero knowledge proof, which is communication concept with no real data transfer. For example, digital signature, you have a transfer over data, but this data actually is, um, is not real data, it's just a digital signature. And then you have split knowledge, which is multiple users required to perform the operation. And this happens sometimes in very critical um, information access where you require you, you need to have two people accessing at the same time in order to enable the access to the data. So after understanding the difference between encryption and hashing, it's also, also very important to understand the difference between some symmetric and asymmetric uh, encryption. So symmetric encryption, as the name mentioned, is actually the same key that allows you to encrypt and decrypt 
the information. Asymmetric needs a public and a private key, so you will need a pair of key in order to encrypt and decrypt the information. A clear um, an example of question that you might or scenario that you may to have to uh, answer during your CSSP exam is actually how many keys will you need if you are in a symmetric scenario and this is how you calculate let's say how you have 12 users and they are having symmetric keys therefore you need 12 times 12 minus 1 divided by 2 total number of keys. In the asymmetric case, if you have 12 users, they will need 12 keys. So make sure that you understand this and it's a very simple example, but it helps you to it helps you to rem remember. And again, you might have a scenario asking you to calculate the number of required keys. You also might want to check the different encryption algorithm types. You might have a question uh, about the symmetric or asymmetric ones, and AES is one of the most known. And then, of course, I will not go through the details. I just let you go by yourself and understand the difference, uh, technical differences between this encryption algorithm. It's really, um, it doesn't require you to know all the details, but it's good to know the principles and the basics. After having a look on different encryption algorithms, it's also good for you to understand how the digital signature standard works. And this is basically a very high level um, definition. I definitely advise you to go a little bit more into details and understand how it works. However, the message is that digest functions are uh, SHA1 and SHA2. Uh, plus one encryption algorithm that can be one of the three mentioned be below. So DSA, RSA, or ECDSA. So just check them out. Um, it might come down as well in the exam. The CA might be an independent third party as well and be separated from the user and the system. And in that case, it's called the registration authority which may or may not be separate from the CA. So currently, some of the main usages of PKI are, for example, encryption of uh, send or authentication of email messages using OpenPGP and SMIME. So we're going to mention that as well later on. Uh, for example, you have also the authentication of users to applications, like for example, smart card logon or SSL. So it PKI has really a lot of usage currently, and you need to understand how that works, especially make sure that you understand the CA's uh, role and how the, it works in terms of generation of the certificate and the creation of the web of trust as well. So the web of trust is actually a concept used in PGP and uh, is basically to establish the authenticity of the uh, link between the public key and its owner. So the difference between the public key infrastructure, PKI, and the web of trust is that the PK, PKI KI is centralized and the web of trust is decentralized. So again, make sure that you have a clear understanding of the PKI and the web of trust and the difference between both. Let's move now to the Internet Protocol Security or IPsec, which is actually a protocol that authenticates and encrypts the packets of data sent over the network. And it's used currently through the VPN. So we can see here clearly from the slide that we have two modes, the transport mode and the tunnel mode. And then we have different protocols, which are authentication header, AH, and encapsulating security payload, ESP. So IPsec tunnel mode is the default mode and the most common. With the tunnel mode, the entire original IP is protected by IPsec. 
In tunnel mode, an IPsec header, AH or ESP header, both for both protocols, is inserted between the IP header and the upper layer protocol. An important point to know is that the AH can be applied alone or together with the ESP when IPsec is in tunnel mode. IPsec transport mode is used for end-to-end -end communications. For example, for communication between a client and a server or between a workstation and a gateway. So IPsec uses these two distinct protocols, which we have been talking about, AH and ESP. The AH protocol provides a mechanism for authentication only. AH provides data integrity, data of origin authentication, and an optional replay protection service. The ESP provides actual encryption and encrypts the payload of the packet and protects it from snooping. AH only provides message authentication as mentioned, which makes it the clear difference between ESP and AH. Make sure that you understand the difference between both and remember it. Two other concept, concepts that can come up in the exam are certification and accreditation. So which one comes first and which one is related to one? You need to understand that the certification is a technical evaluation, for example, of a solution. And then the accreditation comes, from example, from the final acceptance of the management of the solution. So both comes in different orders and both are done by different kind of teams. So first certification, the technical evaluation, and then the accreditation, which is the process of formal acceptance. Okay, I'm jumping to the CPU, which actually is a central processing unit. And I'm jumping into this because you can actually find questions asking you about scenarios and making sure that you understand the different definition between and differences between multitasking, multiprogramming, and multiprocessing. So let's start from the beginning. A central processing unit is the electronic secretary within a computer. And therefore this CPU can perform can be either a single processor, either a multiple processor. So you can have a multitasking, which is actually a single processor, or multiprogramming, which is also a single processor, but with several programs in different stage of executions, or multiprocessing, which actually is related to multiple processor and therefore simultaneous executions of several programs. This is very important to understand the small differences between the three notions. Multitasking is the concept of performing multiple tasks, as the name stipulated. And basically, the task can be also processes. And this um, execution will be over a certain period of time and executed concurrently. So the difference between what you need to remember is multiprocessing is multiple processor, but both multitasking and multiprogramming are based on a single processor. After a quick overview of the CPU, let's go into different kinds of systems. And different types of systems will actually will depend on the knowledge that the user needs to have to access to the system. And we have one, two, three, four types. The first one, which is a dedicated system, it allows all, it needs all the users to have clearance, access permission, and need to know for all the data. The next one is system high mode, which actually does not require the need to know for all the data, but does require the users to have clearance, access permissions. The compartmented mode is actually does not require the need to know and does not require the access permission but only requires the users to have the clearance and then the multi-level mode removes all the three requirements this is just a quick overview but i definitely recommend you to know the differences between all of them 
let's pa pass now to the next um, concept, which are actually the different evaluation systems or modes, and we have three of them. So again, very important to remember the difference between the three. TCSEC is a Trusted Computer System Evaluation Criteria. It comes from the United States. That's what you need to remember. ITSEC is actually an Information Technology Security Evaluation Criteria, and that comes from Europe. And the TCP is a trusted computing base, which includes and defines also criteria for hardware, file, firmware, and software components. So make sure you know the difference between the three of them. I am not going into the details of each of them, but they definitely are important. I suggest you just go on Google and Google them to understand a little bit more or use the official study of ISC Square. The concepts that we will be addressing in the next slides are part of the TCB, which actually includes another concept, which is the reference monitor. And the reference monitor validates the access of the subject to the resource. And this is based on also the concept of rings of protection, which works with the TCP. So the rings of protection or hierarchical protection domains are actually mechanism that allows to allow to protect the data from false and malicious behavior, all by malicious behavior. And basically, as you can see from the slide, you have the ring zero, ring one, ring two, and ring three. You need to make sure that you have a clear understanding of the difference between the three of them. So ring zero is the represents the OS kernel, kernel, the ring one other OS components, the ring two is for drivers, protocols, and the ring three is actually the user level programs and applications. So as per the number of ring, you have four privilege levels ranging from zero to three. And the number three, the ring three, is actually the least privileged. And therefore, as you can see, it represents the user level programs and application. When a lesser privileged process tries to access a higher privileged process, a general protection fault is reported by the OS. And this is, for example, web browsers, which are running on a higher number of drinks, they need to request access to the network, a resource restricted to a lower number of drink. So just as a global knowledge actually windows uh, nt does like unix does not fully utilize the current model however the ring zero for kernel code and device driver and rings two for privileged code and ring three for unprivileged and privileged code is being used so bring your own disaster, no, 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 bring your own device. It's a concept that is related to managing the privately or corporate owned devices, including smartphones and mobile phones and, um, um, and iPads, for example. Uh, definitely it's not bring your own disaster. Maybe it can become, but what you need to uh, remember is that bring your own device is a concept that is part of the CSSP, and you need to understand how to uh, implement first the policies around this and then apply them and implement them with the right solution. So let's pass now to another concept that you need to understand, which is actually called the cover channel. And the cover channel is a method that is used to transfer information, but it's not normally used for information transfer. An example of cover channel is actually steganography and this might use a technique like a dead drop where you can post a picture um, and you view the posting on, on online but actually 
uh, there is uh, some data that is hidden within the picture itself. It's very often used. And there was a story about uh, a company uh, that had a lot of information leaked through pictures posted over social media. So this is a, a very clear example of a covert channel. The next concept that you need to understand is actually the buffer overflow. And it's not the buffalo flow. It's, uh, yeah, I'm getting, uh, I'm trying to get a little bit this course uh, funnier. So definitely buffer overflow means that there was no check or actually the size check of the memory was failed. Um, and this happens very often when the, uh, the programmer does not put in place the right controls uh, in terms of the inputs and therefore, of course, the system then will be compromised. Top two is another concept that is uh, actually funny to remember, tic-tac, tic-tac. It's a time of check to time of use, which actually uh, relates to checking the state of data or resource and actually is uh, a bug that is caused by a change in a system between the checking of the condition and the use of the result of the condition and an example of that is actually of a race condition and a race condition is the behavior of an electronic software system where the output is dependent on the sequence sequence of timing uh, or, uh, or timing of other uncontrollable events. So this becomes a, a bug only when the events do not happen in order. So this is how talk to work is actually taking, in, uh, taking advantage of uh, this exploit when there is a bug and therefore there is no uh, clear verification of the sequence of the events. And the, the attacker can over can use that uh, in order to attack the system. So remember, talk to. So I'm jumping to another concept here and important knowledge for you. So after several um, techniques or bugs or different uh, risk analysis that have been more related to the different concepts of risk management, as I mentioned, uh, physical security is part of it. So as we mentioned data and as we're mentioning asset inventory, it's important also to understand that the CSSP takes in consideration and defines all the physical security that you need to put in place in order to pro pro protect your data and achieve the three security principles, so confidentiality, integrity, and availability of your data. So physical security is definitely a must, and that is taking in consideration the site management, the personnel control, awareness training, emergency, emergency response, and procedures as well. Uh, it can be, again, uh, for example, locks on the door and much more. So make sure that you actually understand that physical security is definitely part of uh, your security measures and control. And for that, there are different kind of controls, including the technical physical controls, where, as I mentioned, you can have CCTVs, you can have intrusion detection, detection, you can have alarms, you have power supplies in case of power failure, fire detection and suppression as well. One of the different information that you need to be able to remember is actually the requirements for a data center. The humidity in the data center should be between 40% and 60% and not below, not uh, beyond 60% not be below 40%. The temperature should be between 10 and 26 Celsius degrees or 50 and or 80 Fahrenheit. And this might be addressed in one of the questions. So make sure that you have uh, enough information about it. And just coming back to the physical controls as well, there's uh, definitely locks, constructions, materials, man traps, dogs and guards that are also part of that and you have certain types as well for 
physical con uh, physical security you can have preventative controls where you have for example a big sign saying you cannot enter you have detective controls and we mentioned the cctvs you have corrective controls to restore or recover the operation as a business continuity plan and you have a uh, for example, uh, in the business continuity plan, you can have an off-site office, as we mentioned. And you have three types of signage. You have the hot sign, when it's immediate, you can go there and everything is ready for you to continue your operation. You have a warm sign, where you need much more time. However, you have certain basics already in place. And you have a cold sign, where you literally have just the walls and you need to put in place the whole infrastructure. Um, then you have the deterrent controls, which actually are used to basically encourage compliance or actually just deter someone uh, having a security guard can be considered as a deterrent control as well so make sure that you have the right control in place and that was the security engineering domain that requires you to have uh, a really a very good and high understanding of the different concepts that I mentioned. Uh, do not hesitate to ask me more questions when I post the course, but just go and take, take a break and come back for the next domain. So how are you guys? I hope you are still energetic to continue to check the different concepts uh, I have been trying to put in place again the concepts that are really important for you to go through. Uh, there are some details and some less details so make sure you have the books with you and just put attention uh, to every single concept. You need to understand them all. You need to make sure that you know how they function and how they work. So now we have been through different domains and we're going to go through the communication and network security very soon. So I hope you had a good break and you are all rested to take the next chapter and domain. Cheers. So let's continue with communication and network security. This domain is actually really heavy and requires you to know really very technical uh, concepts. Uh, I have this domain literally made me remember my uh, my university days where I was in engineering school and we had this uh, this concept out there during my my classes. So good memories and good refresh for you as well, I guess. So let's go through. So first of all, uh, you need to understand and remember the OC and the TCP IP um, models, they both are similar but different. So the OC model has seven layers, starting from the physical data link network transport. So you have a lot, you need a lot of strength to remember all of them, but basically let's go through physical data link network transport session presentation and application. Yeah, you made it. And then TCP IP, you have the network access IP, TCP and applications. So you have four for TCP IP and seven for the OC model. So let's go layer by layer. So the physical layer is actually the one in charge of the transfer of bits. So as you can see in the in the diagram, you have literally the physical rail and you have the transmission of bits from one layer to another through from one sorry party to another through the transmission medium, which can be uh, an Ethernet cable, for example. And then an example of equipment that are actually handling the physical layer. And this is important for you to remember. You need to have in mind the example of equipment for your exam. So, for example, a repeater will be in the physical layer. A modem will be in the physical layer. A fiber media converter as well. So, physical layer, again, is actually in charge of the transmission of bits from one party to the other through the transmission medium. And some equipments can be a repeater or modem or even a hub. Now the data layer. The data layer actually combines uh, bits into bytes and therefore bytes into frames. We're going to go and describe later 
uh, the frames for you to understand. And it does use MAC addresses. And this is for you important to understand. So the data layer, which is the second layer, uses MAC addresses. And I am putting that very clearly for you here. Remember, uh, because it will make a difference for your exam as well. So the second layer has two sub-layers, which is the logical link control and the media access control sub-layers. Uh, I will let you go and search for the details by yourself because it's a, it's a very high level course and sh um, constrained with time. But an example of equipment that you need to remember for your uh, exam are bridges, layers to switches. And this is where we're going to actually come to the fact and to the MAC addresses back. So you need to remember that you can have switches as part of the layer two, and they will actually act as multi-port bridges. And now let's look at the different protocols. So yeah, there are a few of them, and you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight protocols that are within the data layer and that you need to understand. So again, I'm not going to go from the details of each of them. I have been through the important points in the previous slide, but you need to be get acknowledged with them and understand them. The network layer allows you the logical addressing. So basically, an example would be of equipment would be routers or switches. And here we go where I told you. Remember, we're going to talk about the layer two switches, which actually are using MAC addresses, but they can be also layer three switches, which will actually have a different um, scope or a different action as well and here we go so you have the layer 2 switch which actually switching only so it will use the mac address to switch the packets from a port to the destination the layer 3 switch will not only do the switching it will actually do also as well routing and that's the difference so whenever you have a question is it the switch layer 2 or layer 3 make sure that you understand what the switch is literally doing. For example, if the switch is routing, then the switch will be within the layer 3. We end up only use an IP routing table as well. And again, the network layer as well has different protocols that you need to be familiar with. And I'm not going to count for you, you probably know how to count it. But definitely you need to understand how at least they work. My um, advice would be to focus on each of them. Uh, it will be beneficial for you, not only for the exam, but as well for your career as a cybersecurity professional. Not memorizing, but understanding how they literally work. And then the fourth layer, which is the transport layer, allows you to have one, two, three, four, five protocols, and they are the TCP, UGP, which are the most famous. We're going to come back to that, as well as the SSL and TLS. But I'm going to focus on TCP and UGP for you, and this is why precisely. So the UGP difference with the TCP is that actually the TCP is connection oriented and is more reliable than the UGP. And you have here a table that I found very interesting for you to show the differences between the different UGP protocol and the TCP protocol. However, Let's go and see the next one. So the session layer, which is the fifth one, and it's not the music session, but it's a TC, it's a OC uh, session. It's the fifth layer, and this actually layer is in charge of the authentication, authorization, and session restoration. So, for example, you will have protocols as SQL, NFS or RPC. And the sixth layer, which is the presentation layer, is actually the 
layer in charge of the data presentation. So definitely if you have any question related to uh, the file extension, for example, you would have the file uh, with an extension GIF or JPEG, that means that this is the type of file and therefore you are in the presentation layer that allows you to encrypt as well as compress your data and present it. So there's one important point that you need to remember here is HTTP is actually an application layer protocol. However, of course, it needs to display some data and therefore uses presentation layer features. And again, you have the different examples of uh, protocols. So you have the JPEG, MPEG, TIFF, etc. So I'll let you take a look on that. Then we have the application layer, which is actually the seventh layer. And then mission accomplished, you actually can visualize your data on, for example, your browser. And this is representing the user interface for the applications mainly. And you have protocols as HTTP, FTP, SMTP, Telnet, POP3, for example, IMAP, etc. So make sure that you know all the seven layers of the OC model and also the, different, uh, the difference between when you actually have the right equipment and which kind of layer the equipment is working on, as well as the different protocols and extensions of files. So I told you we're going to come back to the frame. So here's our frame that you need to have a clear understanding of. So a frame will be composed by destination address, source address, a type, data packet, and a frame check sequence. So this is a clear, uh, very high level understanding for you with the number of bytes. So just make sure that you re uh, memorize that and recognize what is missing if something is missing in a frame. Then let's go to the TCP IP model, which as I told you is different from the OZ model. OZ model seven layers, TCP IP four layers. They are similar but different. So same, same, but different. So you have network access and local network, which is the first layer, and that involves uh, the physical as well as the network interface. Then you have the internet layer, and then the host to host, process and application. I won't go into the details of all the protocols, but I showed you and described the difference between TCP and UDP. Make sure that you remember that. I will just go and address now the different, um, actually, internet protocols. So you know that we have now since several years moved to IPv6 and the difference between IPv4 and v6 is clearly the number of bits and IP, IPv4 was actually running out of uh, addresses as you might be aware so we needed more addresses and for that um, the researchers come come with uh, come up with IPv6 which is 128 bits so you have a lot of much more possibilities the differences between both is not only the number of bits but also that the IPv4 is using decimal and the IPv6 is using hexadecimal so the appearance is definitely different but also there are several rules that are different. And one of the main rules is actually around the zeros. So you have the IPv6 that is looking like that as an initial address, uh, 20080CB9000000000000 EE00052732. So if you look at the zeros, you actually realize that in the IPv6 rules, you can remove all the leading zeros. So basically, the, whenever you write uh, four zeros, you can reduce that to one zero. But that's not all. You can actually omit the consecutive groups of zeros, and then therefore you just leave the two points, which is really helpful in terms of uh, operations. Uh, then 
for example, and this is really unlike this example, is the look back address is literally equivalent to uh, two points, two points and one. Uh, how, how great is it? So this is the difference between IPv4, IPv6. Make sure that you understand the differences and that you know how many possibilities you can have uh, and how many number of addresses you can have with IPv4 and IPv6. Let's move towards the different classes. This is something that you would be required to know as well. As you know, in terms of uh, IP addresses, there are different branches and classes that are defined depending on the RFC 721 document. And therefore, you have class A, B, C, D, and E. So the different classes have different masks and as you can see the class a has the first byte that defines the network therefore the mask is 255.0.0.0 and we continue like that so what you need to remember as well is how to calculate uh, an address depending on the mask a subnet and also to understand that you have a multicast traffic uh, addresses which are the 224.0.0.0 to 239.255.255.255 and that you have reserved addresses which are the 240.0.0.0 uh, to 255.255.255 which are actually the class E addresses so make sure that you have a clear understanding of this and that you can uh, handle for example a request to define an address or to define a multicast address as well so one of the other internet protocol is actually the internet control messaging protocol and icmp will actually allow you to diagnose an error uh, that happens or a problem that happens when the packet is sent and this is what you need to remember is actually that the ICMP will help you to have the reason and diagnose the error that happens while you are transmitting your package. The ARP which is actually the address reservation protocol and the Reverse address resolution protocol are two protocols that allows you to trans, trans, um, transfer or tra uh, transform actually an IP address into a MAC address and vice versa. So what you need to remember is that the ARP will allow you to have to trans, uh, transform IP address into a MAC address and the IP ARP will transform the MAC address into an IP address and ARP only works between devices in the same subnet. That is also another point that you need to remember uh, is whenever you have an example of, for example, uh, an example of, I'm repeating myself, an example of uh, two different subnets, it actually cannot go and use the ARP protocol only. So make sure that you remember that. Okay, guys, so now the TCP three-way handshake, as you can see, uh, this is a handshake uh, uh, protocol. It's actually uh, related to what we have addressed previously. TC the difference between TCP and UDP is that TCP is reliable and therefore is actually sending you a message to acknowledge uh, with an acknowledgement or reception. That is what is different. So you have the significant acknowledgement number and then you have as well a synchronization with a se sequence number value. So this is the difference. And for example, the UDP, you can see here that there's no handshake at all and no conf confirmation or actually acknowledge of reception. Um, in terms of data. So that is the difference. So make sure you understand again TCP more reliable, UDP less reliable and no acknowledgement of data reception. Here we go. So the TCP reliable needs a connection and can control as well the congestion while the UDP is much more faster and therefore that is why it's used. 
but there is no confirmation of reception or acknowledge of reception from the UDP point of view. So here we go, you need definitely to have a clear understanding of the ports and you have 1,023 ports that are well known out of a total of 65,535. I definitely advise you to go through the most known. You probably know them already, like SSH is 22, HTTP is 80, HTTPS is 443. An important point is, and that is for your own experience as well, is that you can move SSH, for example, port from the default port and uh, put it in an additional not well-known port that will actually help you to avoid a script kitty attack for example and this can work for any other uh, uh, you know port number so it's up to you to analyze the situation and see what you would like to know to do and then let's go into the analog and digital there's a concept that as well you need to understand and probably you do at least i do remember using a digital uh, uh, sorry, an analog phone, you might not, it depends on when you have been born, but it's important to understand that each measurement actually, when it comes to analog uh, signal, is measured and then according to the amplitude is transformed into byte. And this is something that uh, have been used uh, using different, uh, um, you know, methods. Uh, I won't go into the details because it is just um, a quick overview of digital and um, analog. So let me know if you have any questions about that. I'll be happy to provide you more details maybe in the next in the next course. An important understanding for you as is actually the different Ethernet communication. So while we are going from uh, while we are going from analog to digital, of course, we are going into transferring the data over the different networks. And for that, we have absolutely a different type of networks, including Ethernet networks and different typology. So the most commons are as below. You have the mesh. Uh, typology, you have the star typology, you have the bus topology, you have the ring topology, and you have the, uh, the full connected network topology. So every each of them have advantages and disadvantages. However, for example, let's go through three of them. The mesh, mesh topology will allow all workstations to be connected to each other and therefore will allow a connectivity to any point of at any point of time the clear disadvantage here is that you have uh, a lot of wires required I, I like the picture because it shows clearly that every equipment is connected to another equipment then the star topology is actually allowing you to connect through the main station uh, and here therefore you have a single point of failure if the hub of switch does not work anymore you lose complete connectivity the bus topology is connected to a backbone and saying you have a single point of failure where the backbone does not work therefore the uh, the different uh, the different clients cannot communicate between each other. And here's an example of, for example, of, of concept that you need to understand or remember as well. For the LG45, you use the 10 base T Ethernet, and for BNC, you use 10 base 2. Uh, I advise you to take a look at several, uh, you know, several pictures, several use cases. It can help you to memorize uh, both and the different. Uh, cables that are really uh, sometimes hard to remember at least it was for me um, 15 years ago <laughs> so do not hesitate to literally visualize them like uh, check some pictures in Google and that will help. this includes as well understanding the different uh, wire 
types and the twisting wires helps actually to reduce the effect of strain capacitance noise and signal loss so if you have a question which is the best you need to remember that the twisting wires are helping to reduce these effects And now let's go into the wireless technologies. So we're not going into the details as one of the one that will keep it for the next time, but let's go into the Wi-Fi uh, standards and encryption standards. So we have the web, which is wired equivalent privacy. We have the Wi-Fi protected access, which is the WPA, and we have the WPA2. So it's important to realize that it, nowadays, we recommend highly to use the WPA2, and this is for a clear reason that, as you can see, the web has doesn't have any key rotation, and therefore you can actually reuse the keys as well, which creates a very high security vulnerabilities. And then. The, you can use the web keys as well as authentication. It's very different from the WPA and the WPA2, which are using dynamic session keys and changes uh, automatically with an automatic distribution, and they definitely have a certain uh, change uh, management and therefore a cycle, a life cycle that is defined. So nowadays, uh, in terms of uh, the most secure will be WPA2 that will be implemented. And this is what you need to remember. So when it comes to Wi-Fi signals or networks, there are several attacks that can be uh, I would say acted or provided by uh, cyber criminals, including wall walking, um, and this attack is basically walking around to find out open Wi-Fi, or wall driving, and the only difference is that you drive around. Wall flying is actually flying around. Um, you might actually use maybe a drone nowadays to fly around the building and find out if there are open networks around. Wall choking, and this is interesting, I'm not sure if it's really still uh, very uh, often used, it's actually drawing of symbols in public places uh, to advertise uh, an open Wi-Fi network. And as you can see, uh, these are the different uh, types uh, and different symbols that you can, you can use. At least I don't see that in, uh, in Singapore uh, at the moment, or I didn't see that either in other countries. So please, uh, thank you very much for this course. This is just the first um, course, very high level, giving you the main concept that I consider very important for you to understand, to remember. If you have any other question regarding any concept that I define, uh, I will, I'm definitely happy to answer of any question uh, and the next one will come soon hopefully after two to three weeks you will have the four other domains and then after that you will have an additional one covering some more details about concepts that i have not covered and i will not cover on this on this two uh, parts of the course. So please, again, make sure that you have the original study guide and that you use the original and legitimate exam practice questions. It's very important for you. There are different concepts and security framework or standards that have been and uh, have been described within the CISSP uh, study book and they are required for you to know. For example, the COVID, which is actually Control Objectives for Information and Related Technology, is a security concept infrastructure. And the difference between COVID and COSO is that the COVID focuses more on the operational level and the COSO deals more on the strategical level. Be sure that you remember this and go into more details in order to understand how both works. They might come out in the exam. It is also worth to understand how the principles of NISTAR and OCTAV. Uh, NIST and OCTAV are focusing on IT threats, while some other are actually taking a much broader approach in terms of risk management.
And the last one that I would like you to remember is actually the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD. This organization is handling and tackling all the economic, social and government challenges, uh, especially when it comes into data transfer between countries. So hi guys, I hope you enjoyed this course. Uh, so I'm done for today. Uh, again, as I said, I try to give you the most important concepts that you need to understand, you need to remember, you need to be sure that you have examples, that you understand the differences, and, um, and that's it. So good luck in your studies, and let me know if you have any questions. Um, I will be following up on Pirlais, as I mentioned. Cheers, bye-bye, I'm off, weekend time.